Cheers to another one. Knives down. Aprons off. The last table is served. The station is broken down. Everything's put away. Your inventory is complete. And now it's time to meet me on the back dock where all the most important meetings are held. We chef! Take a deep breath and enjoy a job well done. At ease, kick off your clogs, smoke them if you got them. How about a nice cold beverage? Maybe a little bit of ice vine, a little bit of mountain sunshine. What do you think? Pull up a milk crate, let's get comfortable, and let's get to the good shit. Oh, yes, chef. We're on the dock with Taryn Cam, former chef, founder and head coach of Real Chefs Movements. He helps chefs avoid burnout and reclaim their energy to live a happy, fulfilling life. And on the dock, he gets real about the frustration, dismay, and fear he faced as he turned away from what he knew without knowing if anyone else would resonate with what he was being called forward for. Not like any of us can relate to where he was at. And even less of us know what it might be like to follow that dream. But shit, I'll let him speak for himself. And you can hear what got him through those tough times. Taryn Cam, y'all. I am doing a little bit of a post series at the moment of a timeline of my life in the kitchen. And to start it off in Ballarat the way that I did, that was the small town. It was really tough. I lost a lot of sleep over it. I was always hanging in the balance of whether I was going to keep a job or not because I just had no idea what was going on, mate. I'm like, cool, the dishes go in the dishwasher and what do I do next? And then I'd get a few orders barked at me. And I'm like, oh, my God, what am I doing in here? I have no idea how to keep this going, how to keep it structured. And once I got my head around it, well, yeah, the head got a little bit bigger, I guess. And <laughs> I, thought it, <laughs> I thought it would have been smart to jump up on this island and that steward job, mate. Oh, my God. I, I'm not sure if I've ever had a harder job in my life, to be honest with you. And to be taking out the head steward position there was to be work, working 14, 16 hour days. And I went from this single compartment dishwasher in this small town to rocking up and seeing this conveyor belt beast where you could have six rats cycling through. And I was just like, what is this? This is crazy. And the same thing happened. Losing sleep. I'm going to lose my job. I'll get kicked off this island. What do I do? And somehow along the way, I just fell in love with everything that was being organized, being the fastest, being the best. I, I never looked back, to be honest, mate. And the respect that the chefs had for me and the way I went about it was was an amazing feeling. And I couldn't agree with you more, mate. Every kitchen stops at the kitchen hand. It certainly does. And this island that you were working at, did they do lots of banquets as well? So you had to kind of like round up everything and make sure that the kitchen had what they needed. So you're taking care of it before they actually even need it and then taking care of it after. Absolutely. And the, the operations didn't stop there. I mean, we had the steel section, we had the pit and then we had obviously the order, the marching orders from the chefs. And once a week, we'd have the barge delivery as well, where it was a matter of setting up all of the long railings work out of life, by the way. Oh my God. And we'd set that up and I'd crush this, this whole delivery from the boat. And we'd end up just grabbing oh my God, these yeah. boxes, throwing them everywhere, going into different storage units. And oh my Lord, it was absolutely crazy. And I, I had, I had so much pride in getting up at four thirty in the morning and meeting with the executive chef and sun's just starting to come up over this beautiful place and we're like all right well there's the barge and you can see the boat coming in and you can see all the maintenance lads and all the tradies ready to mm -hmm. bring it across and game on mate never had a harder job than this one and um i always look back very fondly on it it really did lay a foundation for me and did you find that throughout your career and the different things that you've done that this idea of you stressing about whether or not you're doing it correctly and worrying about you know, what's my next step? What the hell am I doing? I don't want to look bad. Uh, you know, how, how can I bring it up? Has that kind of followed you around? Yeah, it did for a very, very long time. I even had a bit of imposter syndrome, to be honest with you, right up until when I qualified as, as a chef in the sense, and I, I'm kind of grateful for it now I look back, but I wasn't one of those people that woke up one day and said, I'm going to be a chef. I was never one of those. And I think that there's a real split down the middle of those that wake up with the passion or those that get woken up via the passion, if you will. <laughs> and for myself, yes, that work ethic separated me and was able to get me to where I was as a professional chef. But there was always that underlying, am I doing the right thing? And there was always that underlying, oh my God, I'm uncomfortable. How do I get comfortable? Right, 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 right. What was your family like? 
lifelike. Oh, absolutely brilliant. Yeah. I couldn't have asked for more. Brothers, sisters. More. Yeah, I've got three brothers. Amazing people. My parents, I could bang on. We could do a whole hour podcast on my thoughts about <laughs> my parents, to be honest. I, I am forever grateful for them. Uh, for myself, with the university course, I was supposed to be doing human movement and sports science. They supported me all the way through to not performing there, to getting around the country, washing pots and pans, to getting loose, to losing myself, to becoming a chef, to all the way through till now, I just I just cannot be more grateful for them, the work ethic and the morals that they've raised me with. Just just couldn't be more grateful, mate. Fantastic upbringing. And at what point in your career did you decide that, that maybe you wanted to do something else? Yeah, good question. So to be honest with you, I, I, I got caught in the spider web big time. As soon as I donned the chef whites and it was never a fairy tale, I was put on a fryer section in a pub that was also part larder, part appetizers, part everything. It was the section where everything else goes. Uh, so it, it was a tough one. And again, very uncomfortable, again, fearing for my job. But the moment that I picked up some rhythm there, the moment that I earned just the little, the tiniest bit of respect from the head chef, Uh, was the moment I grabbed it and ran. And it would have been almost 10 years from that date before I started to have the inklings and thoughts to change it up. And the shift, I believe there was a foundation for the shift towards fitness, probably from the word go in the sense that I've had a solid fitness base all all of my life. Mm -hmm. I played football seriously. I hit the gym hard. I learned the hard way about health and how to look after yourself from a very, very young age. And there were a couple incidents throughout my career or a couple moments where I wasn't treating myself well, Adam, whether it was just teetering with burnout or getting hooked into substances yet again, or just somewhere in between along there. And every single time I consider myself lucky, whether I was 21, 25, 27, 30, I always had the knowledge of how to use fitness as a weapon to get myself out of deep shit. And I got myself into deep shit quite a few times. <laughs> I don't think you're alone in that. Oh, to be honest with you, mate, I'm just forever grateful to have fitness in my back pocket. But on the final occasion, well, it was a combination of uh, coming out of substances and dealing with two years of chronic pain and using fitness to get myself out of that trouble really gave me a revelation where I was like, I think I can help people do this. I think I can actually help people get out of pain. I can help people get strong. I think I can help people live a healthier life. And I think I need to rekindle with that guy that was 18 years old and got into his first preference university course. And maybe he's got the bloody head on his shoulders to do it this time. And (laughs) Instead of doing a uni course, I, I got my personal training certificate and that was uncomfortable diving deep into a gym and going, okay, I've gone from doing this for a living and having a paycheck and being pretty comfortable to my first paycheck in the fitness industry. If I'm going to convert it to us dollars was about $380 for the week. Yeah. That was a scary moment. Sink or swim. Do you want to talk about uh, the type of chronic pain that you were in? Absolutely. So what happened to me was I was using my body like shit. Mm Mm-hmm. Essentially, we all know the score. Punching over the benches, mm. lazing around, knocking off work, drinking a whole lot of piss, uh-huh. smoking pot, chain smoking cigarettes, any, any option that I had to get outside. I was also in the mode of trying to get myself out of that pattern. And funnily enough, I did a little bit of a number on myself whilst in the gym. I believe this number was done from already having the wrong structure in my body, already not treating myself well. But I strained, and I say only strained a muscle that connects from the rib to the hip. Mm -hmm. That's all I did. It was a light strain. I remember waking up, getting ready for work, leaning over the sink to expel the uh, toothpaste mix and going, that hurts, that hurts. Something's wrong and it's deep. I'm going to go with the mantra I've gone with the last 15 years of my life and hope it takes care of itself. Two weeks later, the pain's a little bit more dull. The pain's a little less bearable. Mm -hmm. A month later, the pain is now recurring down my left hip. It is starting to creep up my lower back. 
It is like there is like nerves crawling around in the lower abdomen area. Yeah. Starting to get starting to get serious. Saw a physio, saw a couple other therapists, got given a couple stretches. Right. Got given some hydrotherapy techniques. Didn't do a lot. Ripped that muscle in the kitchen at some point. Gave it a good rip. That was tough. It knocked my hips out, my lower back, and it was basically a two-year road to recovery once I met the right person, which would have been about, it was a two-year road to recovery, a year of trial and error. And then a year after I met somebody who was a grumpy sports physiotherapist, he was mortified by the way I was living my life. I was viciously underweight. I was still smoking. I had no life in my eyes, mate. Right. And he saw that as an opportunity to kick my ass into gear, to tell me what's what, and to show me that if I'm going to continue taking a shit on my body, I will continue to feel like Mm -hmm. a piece of that. So really the answer was aggression. The answer was I need to get strong. The answer was I need to get back to my roots. Right. This guy flogged me in the gym, on the massage table. He made my life a misery, but he also brought back the joy. Good. And he also taught me how to respect myself again. So it was almost like getting schooled. To be honest, mate, this guy schooled me beyond belief. (laughs) And if we want to talk about getting schooled, let's let's talk about the school from around 40 years ago, uh, where the belief systems and the things you're allowed to do as a teacher were different. That was this guy. (laughs) That was this guy. He... Is a lovely fella. I'm forever grateful for him. Whenever I see his name pop up, whenever I see him, I am absolutely full of respect and full of gratitude. It was a really, really challenging road being in kitchens and having to deal with the pain of attacking such an injury with aggression Mm -hmm. instead of, you know, lengthening the muscle, relaxing therapy, painkillers. It was a really long road, but... There was a point there where I started to see a bit of light after a workout with him. I wasn't as sore. I was a bit more hungrier than usual. I was definitely smoking less. Things were on track. That was a progression. And that right there, I believe, was the seed planted to grab that young fella out of me and go, hey, you're still there, man. You're still there. You still love this. Maybe you can make a shift into doing this. And yeah, to be honest with you, man, it's a very weird place to be visiting to right now. Um, <laughs> it was a really, 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 really challenging time in my life, to be honest. And so, if this grumpy old physio actually kind of sorted you out, would you be okay with throwing his name in the circle? Like, absolutely. His name was Simon McCauley, Simon and McCauley. funnily enough, he was actually the head physio of my favorite AFL football team. For those of you that don't know AFL. Well, it's the Australian Football League, right? Right. But in saying that, really, it's just in my state where most of the teams are and a couple of teams up (laughs) here and there. We're not an AFL dominant country, so it's hard to know what AFL is for a lot of people. Mm. He was the head physio of my favorite team. We had that connection. He was brutal. He was honest. He was everything I needed him to be. And somewhere along the way of him kicking my ass, much like many of the head chefs and executive chefs I had, there was a turning point. There was a moment there of just getting completely ridden, completely demoralized at times Mm -hmm. with how I was treating my body and completely exposed and constantly showing back up, Mm -hmm. constantly putting in the reps for myself. And it's turned into a friendship. That's awesome. And I know you're married now and you have a child. Yeah. At what point during this process did you meet your wife? Yeah. So I ended up going over to London 2000 and, oh, this is tough, this one, uh, 2013-ish. I spent a year and a half. So I got to almost right. 2015-ish thereabouts. And I went to a Christmas party this Scottish fellow was having. Mm. He was working with my wife at the moment, mm-hmm. um, in a, in a, pho- in a, pl- in three, I believe selling phones and somehow, some way my best friend's older brother knew this guy, this guy <laughs> somehow knew to reach out to us. Right. We all rocked up this party. We're in London. It's Christmas, new year's time. And she was there. And 
I'd love to say the rest is history. Do you know what? The rest is history. From that moment there, we're in each other's <laughs> pockets, to be honest, mate. That's great. We spent the next year in London together. I was running out of a visa. Mm-hmm. We initially wanted to use marriage as a tool to just help us stay together. Her parents wouldn't have a bar of it. Right. So I found myself living in Lithuania for six months. Wow, Lithuania. Very cool. Yeah, extremely cool and very much eye-opening. <laughs> an, an Australian boy, I'll call myself at that time, mm-hmm. is looked at like a pretty little flower over in the East European <laughs> land right next door to Russian. <laughs> right, right next door to Russia. Wow. Um, but we went there. They wouldn't have a word of us doing a quick marriage. We did the three-day ceremonial marriage. We got a homestead. Vodka was breakfast. Life was beautiful. Wow. And she came over to Australia, and she has been here since, to be honest. We were supposed to get back, but um, COVID forbid. Right. So she's been with you throughout this entire transformation of you getting injured and then kind of finding a road back and then deciding yeah. that you really wanted to make a contribution to the people in the industry by focusing on them as potential clients. Absolutely. And um, her mum was a chef as well. Um, Mm. Commendable chef as well. She is one of those hard nosed women that you look at straight away and you're like, you are going to love me unconditionally, but I will never F with you ever. (laughs) I never want to be on the wrong side of this. Right. And I remember her saying to her mum when she met me, I'm dating this chef. And she's like, please, please, anyone but a chef. Right. And this is why. And went through why. Mm. And we both know why. And the, the culinary world knows why. Sure. Do you know what? Yeah, she's, she's stuck by my side, man. She went home for a little while there for a couple of months to see her family and whatnot. But she's been in Australia for almost seven years now. She's seen me go from uh, heading kitchens in Australia to dealing with the chronic pain, to making the transformation, to being in a gym, to being booted out of the gym and capitalizing on an idea that was, to be honest with you, Adam, nothing more than a slurry speech I'd make to my dad after a couple of beers. Um, <laughs> That's how things start though. That's how things start. Exactly. Exactly. And that idea stemmed from a good place. It came from heart space. And to be honest with you, I was happy in the gyms. I was, I was like a fish to water, to be honest. Mm-hmm. It didn't take long to, to build a great client base and whatnot, but um, COVID gave me a kick in the ass. In what way? Well, I was booted out of the gym and I had no income. Mm. I had nothing actually. Right. Um, the world came to us and the world stopped. To be honest, yeah. And look, I mean, shout out to the Aussie government. I mean, we were okay. We were supported um, and we were able to get through this time, but for how long? Right. And when you've got a kid uh, and when you've got a wife and uh, you, you've, you've got yourself and you want to support, you need to, you need to do something. And I did. I had all my clients outdoors. No gyms open. Okay, fine. Awesome. I'll meet you in this creep den because it's raining tomorrow and we'll do some kettlebell swings there. We'll do a workout there. I trained clients outdoors. I blew the last of my savings on a business mentor who is still my mentor. He, I'm forever grateful for this person. And we buckled down. We had about $200 to our name and we spent everything that we had and constantly made into RCM, the Real Chefs Movement, and just kept digging deep, 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 kept solving problems, kept finding new beautiful problems the bigger that we got. And somewhere along the way, I was in a position to drop the face-to-face work and be in front of this computer and impact an industry that I have so much love for and individuals that <laughs> I just, I'm just back at home, man. I'm back right. in the trenches with chefs, right. to be honest. I get to speak the way I want to speak, not the way I have to speak on a gym floor. That's it for this episode of Chef Life Radio's On The Dock. There's a new kitchen culture coming and we all get to be part of it. It's what we wanted when we started, but we're either too afraid or pessimistic to ask for it. It doesn't matter what the poster on the wall says. Remember, your workplace culture starts from the bottom up. In fact, it starts with you. At Chef Life Radio, we believe that working in a kitchen should be demanding. It shouldn't have to be demeaning. It should be hard, just doesn't have to be harsh. We believe that it's possible to have more solidarity and less suck it up sunshine, more compassion, less cutthroat island, more partnership and less put up or shut up, and we get to have more community and less fuck you. 
We Chef! And finally, we believe in you. Consider for a second, for all the blood, sweat, and tears we put into what we do, that really, at the end of the day, just some stuff on a plate. None of it really matters. It doesn't define you as a person or make you any more special or less than anyone else. It's just a dance that we're engaged in, so we might as well laugh and enjoy every bit of it. Or didn't you know that the purpose of your life should be to enjoy it? I get happy. I put love it. I am humble. Goddamn Tory Fox, I don't live on now. <laughs> Stand tall and frosty, brothers and sisters. Until next time, be well and do good. In case you didn't realize it, we just got our asses kicked in there, man. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all the other goddamn social media sites at Chef Life Radio, all one word. Visit us on the website at chefliferadio.com. Oh, yes, chef. This show was written, produced, and recorded by me, Adam Lamb, at the Dish Pit Studios in Bardo, North Carolina, and co-produced by Thomas Stephenson. On the Dock is a production of Realignment Media. 